Stephen Sacker on stage for the next session. Stephen, the floor will be all yours right now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm delighted to be back with you. I hope you can all hear me both in Saudi Arabia and wherever you are following this uh, future hospitality summit. I am delighted to say that having had uh, Alex's really detailed, fascinating analysis of the numbers, what is happening to the uh, hospitality and travel business, uh, with all of the data he presented, we can now hear from uh, an individual whose own insight and experience is many, many decades long, running one of the best known travel businesses founded in the UK, but now operating in so many countries, dozens and dozens of countries around the world, offering extraordinary experiences to travelers uh, for a very long time indeed. So please do welcome the founder and co-chair of Abercrombie and Kent, Jeffrey Kent. Jeffrey, are you hearing and seeing me? I can see you very well and i um, very happy to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you because we've heard a lot there uh, from Alex about uh, the overall sort of data being generated by the tour and travel business, hospitality business right now through these many months of crisis. Uh, but I'm going to begin with a very basic question for you. You have been in this business for many decades. Um, have you ever seen anything like this pandemic in terms of its impact on what you do and how challenging the environment is today? Uh, one quick correction. I founded this company in, in Kenya in 1962, not UK. Mm. That's OK. <laughs> no, uh, so <laughs> good, good you reminded me. And uh, obviously from Kenya, you've expanded around the world. But the question does remain, Jeffrey, uh, just how does this compare with other difficult times you've lived through? I was trying to avoid that point. This is the worst. This is the worst pandemic ever. I mean, you know, I've lived through since 1962. We've lived through everything, through SARS, 9-11, all sorts of things, you know, revolutions. Um, but nothing has equaled the um, stress that this pandemic has caused. And talk to me about your company's uh, response. Well, you know, um, we first of all, we have 55 companies within the Abercrombie Kent Group. Um, I own the company with Manfredi Lefebvre, who's a very old friend, we're, so we're private. Um, luckily, we have no bank, so we make all the decisions on our own. Uh, we've got a terrific team of people who've worked with us. And like most companies, we cut back immediately, um, try to figure out what was going to happen, taking the worst, the, you know, almost the worst case scenario. Luckily, we're not, we don't have a great many ships. Uh, we're not an aircraft, so we're more a uh, uh, low cost uh, a corporation to keep going rather than high cost and um, we're literally treading water and waiting for the future you know we've started you know we're, we're probably the first people to ever start uh, eco tourism i started way back in 1982 um, we've already started to have um, trips back to mount kilimanjaro we did two expeditions about two weeks ago um, people do want to come and see nature and your and uh, your previous speaker is right people are happy when they're in nation, it's our, our duty to take them back there. Yeah, I'm just reflecting on what Alex Dichter was saying, Jeffrey, that long haul right now is a particular problem. And so many of your customers are traveling to distant parts of the world, whether they're going on safari or to a, an extraordinary trip to some far off place they've never been before. So what's that doing to your customer base? Well, first of all, we try to get back on the short haul. So our UK company started to sell villas, you know, over the summer, uh, villas in Italy, villas in, in France, uh, the United States, we beefed up our on ground operation in the United States, going to the various national park with the Yosemite, uh, Yellowstone. Um, uh, we use private air where we can. And so that sort of helped a little bit. Uh, Australia, we did the same. Um, we're encouraging people, but as you've already surmised on the trip, our whole business model is dictated by governments. We can create any trip you want, but when the UK government comes back and says, sorry, all in quarantine now, as everybody rightly said, they're not going to travel. You know, they get the fear factor is just underlying and something like that pushes it over the edge again. So we actually have got to start some testing, straightforward, quick testing uh, product and not just wait uh, for the vaccination. Well, you say that's got to happen, but the question is really, will it happen? And if it doesn't happen as quickly as you want it to, will you have to start fundamentally sort of uh, 
realigning the scale of your business? No, you know, we're here, as I said, we're here for the long term. I mean, we've cut back. There's little more we can do. Obviously, we say a prayer each day, hoping this is going to get better, but it is. But I think you're right. You know, the governments will dictate and will continue to. Um, and so we just have to, we're very nimble. We're an agile company. Somebody mentioned that word. Very nimble. I, I wake up every morning and I think, where can we go today? What can we do now? I mean, I was on yesterday to my helicopter pilots in Kenya saying, why don't we do a trip to Ethiopia? All the helicopters there. Why don't we take, because people want to know that they're in an environment that's safe. So if you do small trips with private planes, private aircraft, helicopters, nature, I think that's that'll be the first product will come back. I don't know if you would agree with it, but I think a lot of people see Abercrombie and Kent as a sort of more high-end uh, travel business. Do you think you are in a better place than the more mass market uh, tour operators and travel businesses? Well, you know, obviously we are, we are in the upper end and um, obviously I'm very happy. That's the way we set out way back in 1962 and we've been there ever since. And so actually I think we're in a far better place because we've always been a tailor-made travel group. We've always had experts take care of your travel at the front end. And of course we own all the companies at the far end. So we're able to do all the, all the hygiene that's necessary when you actually travel. And so people will be asking tailor-made, highly personalized trips where they can ask questions at any time and some guarantee of getting them back if something goes wrong. And of course, they all have my cell phone <laughs> and they do that. Do you, do you, that's <laughs> a dangerous thing you're giving out there. But do, that's okay. do you think that the experience your guests, your, your travelers have in the future will be fundamentally different from the way it's been in the past? What, what will be different? Well, I think we could be living uh, with this for some time in a in a modified form. I think that we will always probably for some time have have face masks. I think we'll for some time have social distancing. Uh, we have to emphasize cleanliness and hygiene at every point of the travel uh, spectrum which, which they're going through. So I think things will be a little different for a while. Yeah. Let me ask you about something that perhaps isn't considered so very much. We talk about, you know, the bottom line of your business. We talk about uh, the impact it's having uh, across your business, but we don't necessarily think so much about the local communities that your business operations are so important to. I'm thinking about, you know, communities in Kenya and other parts of Africa, which have become, you know, so dependent on the jobs, the revenues that that your travel business injects into the local economy. At a time like this, when obviously numbers are right down and your your activities, your business activities are being reduced and limited, what can you do for those communities that have built such deep and strong and dependent relationships upon your business? Well, we have something called Abercrombie Kent Philanthropy out of the USA, and we have Friends of Conservation out of the UK, and we've continued. We're already shipping a lot of food, shipping med medical supplies, and we're continuing. That's to obviously Uganda, to our Brindy project, uh, to Zambia, to Nakatindi uh, schools, to our Kenyan projects. But you're right, the sustainable tourism, which is so important for the future, we have to sustain the local tribes who in turn protect the gorillas. As I think you know my gorilla story, that that idea has saved half the world's gorillas, uh, the one in Uganda. Um, fees come up. So we're very, these will come back, these will, these will bounce back quicker. People are already on the top of Kilimanjaro. Obviously, it's a nice, safe place, I'm sure, the top of Kilimanjaro at this minute, but people will come back to Uganda. Small camps, you know, gorillas, forests, and nothing has changed. People will but, come back. And I, think uh, I mean, be honest, back. Jeffrey, isn't there a temptation when, you know, <clears throat> your own business is suffering and margins are tight? Isn't there a temptation to scale back on some of the philanthropic and, and community-based work you do in the countries you operate in? They've definitely been scaled back. The, the key thing is we've got to keep the key thing, the key essential things moving, whether that's food and med medical supplies. That you have to have. So we've been focusing in on that through Abercrombie Kent philanthropy, which is a different organization from Abercrombie Kent. You know, it runs parallel with our company, with its own management. And so, but yes, I mean, the, my, my real concern is not just these involved.
the overall, you know, I was reading all about African parks yesterday, how the private private groups are moving with government groups to protect national parks and uh, inject funds which come from the EU and other areas. I think we've got to get this private, uh, private and public sectors involved for the future, because as somebody else mentioned, this will probably not be the last pandemic. But no, uh, I think, well, one of the people who said that was Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Rifkin, who I don't know if he managed to catch his presentation earlier, but he's you know, a very, a very influential sort of thinker on uh, long term economic and social trends. And, and Jeffrey Rifkin was really trying to tell us all that, yes, we're preoccupied with a COVID pandemic right now, but still massively the biggest long term strategic thing that we all need to be thinking about is climate change and the various impacts of climate change. I just wonder whether for you as a business, you mentioned your eco tourism, your commitment to sustainability. But do you worry that because of the short term business challenges right now that companies will backpedal maybe on some of the sustainability and eco pledges and promises they've made? Well, may, yeah, maybe big companies, big companies may do that. I know we will not do that, but basically it's in our DNA. We've done it since um, 1982, as I think I told you. I listened to Jeremy because I'm, you know, a great admirer of his thoughts. And, you know, he came up with saying the first one, first travel was uh, Thomas Cook with culture. Then he mentioned the next wave with entertainment. And of course, I think what we've been doing all of our lives is adventure, adventure. And then that, of course, leads on to ecotourism, because I think adventure travel will continue because of small groups going to unusual places and they're used to that. So from a, a personal point of view, I think, um, you know, we and other companies in within our spectrum will come back. Quite, actually, I think quite fast. I think we've got to get through next year. And as soon as there's uh, vaccination or some rapid testing, I think, I mean, people are calling me up really all the time saying, when can we travel? What have you got? When are you going? <laughs> there is a pent up. Yeah, there, and that's what Alex was saying, that the desire for experiential travel is undimmed and he thinks it could bounce back quickly. So let me just hopefully seamlessly weave in a first audience question for you, Jeffrey, which is this. Um, do you think if a vaccine becomes widely available in the next few months, that your business and the wider travel business could be normalized by the end of 2021 or 22 at latest? I think, I think the vaccine is one of the key hurdles we have to get over. As long as the government's accepted that if people are vaccinated, but one of my concerns would be, will everybody take a vaccination? Hopefully they will. Um, uh, but as long as the government's accepted and, and they take this quarantine section out, ir irrespective of the vaccination, that's the key thing. But the vaccinations will definitely give people, I think, the, the feeling that they can travel. But we don't have that way. yet. And I don't know if you were across the conversation earlier with uh, that I had with Alexandra de Juniak of, of IATA, and he was pleading uh, for a swift transition from a, a quarantine-based public health protection system in terms of travel to a, an airport test system so that travelers take a quick test before they catch their flight and as long as they're negative they get on board and and there's no question of quarantine at either end do you believe that can happen he said that he's lobbying with you know the travel industry and with wttc and others to get governments to understand how urgent this is but what is your feeling on when that might happen if it might happen well, well, I heard that and I and I clapped because that's exactly what we need. You know, I'm a founder member of World Travel and Tourism Council. Um, I listened to Gloria's talk. We're pushing this hard and fast and we have to keep pushing governments to somehow have rapid testing to take out the quarantine measures because if quarantine's there, people will not travel. How about this one? Uh, again, from our audience around the world, what do you think is going to change in terms of geographical destinations as a result of this pandemic? Well, I think I think that um, Africa will definitely come up pretty fast. I think that the whole villa business, um, which was tailing off a bit, will come back again in Europe. I think South America will be very, very appealing to Americans. I think that I think the natural parks of America will become very interesting again, that Americans always like to stay within their country for a while. I think. That will that will catch on. I think that real adventure, whether it's tracking gorillas, 
climbing, going for treks in Nepal, anything that's out in the open, I think that will catch on. And so, yeah, I think that what won't catch on, I think the big cities will tend to take a stumble. You know, I think that people won't be rushing to Paris, maybe not to London, maybe not to Milan and so on. I think they, they so could do, take a bit. Do you of see yourself repositioning your business at all as a result of this, or are you just going to sort of do more of the same? No, we're working. We're working frantically to change it. I mean, I myself, you know, I need two or three trips a year with private jets. I'm going to start. Uh, some limited private jet trips to Africa. I have my big around the world trip in October where we go to unusual places. And that's already got 40 people booked on it. So I think that um, I think that as long as we start to work on personalizing it, making sure people feel happy that if they travel, we'll get them back. There's somebody they can call if something goes wrong and they've got to be handheld. This fear factor is, is lying just beneath the surface and we need to get over it. We need to make them bold mm. and travel. You need adventurers. <laughs> we need a lot of adventures exactly <laughs> let me ask you this one again from our audience uh you kind of touched on it already but how do you see the future of group travel i guess as opposed to the individual traveler is group travel going to suffer people perhaps less inclined to travel in herds and and want to do their own thing what do you think well we have a group travel business which is uh, cox and kings one of the oldest travel companies in the world and i think that as long as, the, as long as the groups are small and they tend to know each other and that actually that you've done all the research, whether you've got the, whether you've, you've accredited by World Travel and Tourism a Council with their travel safe, which is what we're doing everywhere. I think people will travel, but I think they've got to be, they have to have confidence in the brand. They've got to know, is this a real company? Have they really done the research? Are they getting to Land Rovers that have all the hygiene been checked out and so on? So I think small groups will travel. Large groups, big large groups, I don't know. I'm not so it's sure. interesting you talk about the degree to which confidence matters so much. I mean, you can't afford to have a, a big problem in any of your many, many diverse locations. So I'm just wondering how you can be absolutely sure that quality control, that the auditing of what your people are doing on the ground all over the world works as well, as efficiently as it, as it must. Well, first of all, we're not a company that's a top down with a big headquarters over here and, you know, branches everywhere. All of our companies are wholly owned. So they have their own managing directors, whether it's Kenya, South Africa, India, Egypt, um, wherever, Laos. And so our own managers go out to our own camps, a lot of which we own ourselves, and make sure that all the hygiene is carried out, that all the tests are carried out with all the staff. And so I think we, of all people, have the model for the future, that it's highly, highly personalized. And it, what I call the last mile is tended to by people who work for us, not by agents. And so because they work, they know that the high standards that we insist on. And so basically, Manfred and I feel very confident that our model probably- Do you think your best. business, I'm just thinking about the long-term future, the strategic sort of vision of travel, tourism, hospitality. Do you think your business will be substantially bigger in five years time than it is now? I think we shouldn't, I think we should aim at getting back to where we were. We've got to get back to 2019. You know, I've always told that somebody told me once again, from zero to one is the hardest thing in life. You know, all of us have been pushed back years and years and years of work to zero. We're at zero again. We're now going to get back to 2019, put all of our efforts into that. Once we reach there or getting near there, then we can develop out. But I don't think we should be putting our sights on much more than that. Right? Just a, we're running out of time, Jeffrey, but just a quick thought from you. I always have seen you as a, a real sort of independent spirit in the travel business. And, and it's striking to me that right now, some people across aviation, travel, hospitality, whatever, are desperately seeking government interventions, rescue plans, uh, money from the state to help them get through this very difficult period. Are you uh, an advocate of that? Or do you take the view that market forces must rule and that those who've not managed their risk properly will suffer the consequences and will become sort of natural wastage? <laughs> I'm a bit of both, you know. I mean, I think the airlines, uh, you know, have a very tough time, you know, you know, I've been next to British Airways for years 
And, you know, they're, they're all trying their hardest. And I think they need, they do need government intervention. Probably the airports do too. Because as you said, or somebody did, they're the, they're the blood in our arteries. If we don't have an airline, we're dead. You know, we can't move. So we need the airline to survive. And governments should do everything to help them. Um, so that's the one area that should be put into a box. The rest, I think, should survive on their own. And, you know, uh, too, many, too many dividends were taken out and not enough money put back into keeping the... So we can, we can take it as read, can we, that Abercrombie and Kent won't be seeking a government bailout of any sort? <laughs> well, <laughs> don't I wish... No, no, we're not, even, we're not even thinking of that. We're here, we're here for the long term. Um, as you can see, I'm very, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm not exactly uh, jumping out of the window at this moment. No. I enjoy talking with you and the well, rest of the crew. And can't wait to get For goodness sake, Jeffrey, don't jump out of the window because this is virtual. I wouldn't be able to stop you. So you must, you, you must okay. think about doing that. <laughs> Listen, it's been great to talk to you. Uh, it's great to see you smiling, uh, even in uh, the midst of this uh, very challenging time. And I think people around the world and uh, at this uh, summit will have really appreciated hearing about how you're coping and your thoughts on where the business uh, is going from here. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. And travel quickly. I will. I intend to. And uh, you too. Take, take care. Thank yeah, you very much. Thanks. Thank